This is Fantology. You may have heard of us. All right, what's up, Descendants? This is Steven, your host with Fantology Podcast. I have my lifelong friend Jake here, and we're talking about Dreams of Fire by Shauna Lawless, the new novella that's part of the Gale Song trilogy, first era Gale Song trilogy since Shauna announced that she'll be writing a later era, which I think may kind of factor into a little bit of our conversation. But I have read the first two books of the Gale Song uh, era one. Jake's only read the first book. And this novella, Dreams of Fire, is designed to be a like no spoiler entry point. So even if you haven't read anything, you can read this book. And I thought that uh, was was pretty much true. I think if you have read the other books, you will pick up on more. But I think it did a really good job of also like introducing concepts and groups without being like too repetitive because we kind of already know who they are uh, as readers of the the other books. So it walked that line pretty well. And all in all, um, all things considered, you know, I, I thought it was a pretty good novella. I'm not always a huge novella fan, but I did enjoy this one. And uh, we'll go from there. What do you think, Jake? Yeah, yeah, I really liked it. Um, I think I was I I was kind of skeptical when people were like, "Oh, you can read it in any order," because in my mind, it's like, well, it's just such a different experience usually, you know, the order you read it in. But like you said, I think this did ride that line really well um, because the Ronat, the main like character and POV of this story is one that you get less. I mean, she's like definitely part of book one, what I read, but you don't get like a ton of like insight into her mind. And so seeing things through her perspective, um, more just like flesh things out. It's like almost two halves to a whole. And instead, Fola, who is her her sister, is like the main POV in the first book. Um, And instead, you don't get a ton of her. Like they kind of inverse that. And I think that helps Mm -hmm. it really... Like you said, not feel repetitive. You're not like retreading the same ground um, while also uh, adding like an additional entry into it. Yeah, that's what I don't think I thought of it that way. But like the the empty space there of not mm-hmm. completely understanding uh, Ronat's character from the first two books allows for this novella to work because now we we have the ability to explore fully explore her character and have it be fun for new readers and for those who have read the other books. Well said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Really so well it's done. a shorter novella. I don't know. I can never keep page counts straight these days because you read it on Kindle and it's like, you know, entry 1000 out of 17,000. <laughs> what does this mean as far as pages? My, mine is defaulted to uh, actual pages, I think, because every time I would turn, it wouldn't change every time I turned. And it was, it said 78. So potentially okay. 78 actual book pages. Seems about right. So I feel like yeah. for a novella, that's a little bit on the shorter side. And we can chat about the length. That could mm-hmm. be a, you know, what we thought of that length going forward. Um, also, it came out last week. So by the time this episode gets recorded, it will have been released already. So if you've read Shauna's other books or you're looking to jump in and give it a shot, like, this is an easy way to check out her series and writing. And I think for this first little bit, it's on sale for like a dollar. Yeah. Easy recommendation. I think uh, this novella kind of has a little bit of everything. Like there's some, some cool world building and like lore in it, honestly. And again, maybe not more world building than the first book, but again, filling in those gaps to where like, I was like really interested in it and intrigued by it while also maintaining a decent amount of action for the, the page count that it has. So I think, um, like if you want a little taste into this world, this could be a good way to start, get a good feel for, um, what it has to offer. And for those who have read, I think if you enjoyed the other books, you're going to enjoy this one as well. It's set about a hundred years in the past. So there are some new characters that have been mentioned in the other books and some characters we've seen just Mm -hmm. briefly take more of a center stage and some characters that we know pretty well are, are younger and you get them from a different 
perspective. So I think that's fun and gives it a fresh look. Yeah. Okay, should we cool, get cool. into maybe we'll give it like a rating and then yeah, we'll and then jump get into, into spoilers. some like spoiler thoughts. Yeah. Um I think I think I'd give this one like a seven and a half out of ten. I think it uh like I said, it does a lot for the page count. Um I think my only like only criticism why it wouldn't be higher is just it does kind of leave you wanting more, and that might just be the nature of a novella in general, you know? Um, but, uh, I felt like everything like gave me, like never quite satisfied me with the amount of information I wanted from each mm. like interaction. Um, and also part of that is I haven't read the first book in probably a year ish. So things are a little fuzzy, but I'm going to give it an eight out of 10. I, re I really enjoyed it. I thought I especially thought that there was some like really strong emotional beats that like maybe yeah. feel stuff, which is, you know, nice when books can get to that point. Cause some, some books try, they, you know, really try to get you to care about what's going on and kind of fall flat. But this one, I think really achieved that pretty well. So I'm, I'm really going to bump it up because of that factor. I did think there was one thing in the plot that didn't quite make sense to me. We can chat about that in the spoilers mm -hmm. and so I, I probably knock it down a little bit for that but overall like really solid uh above average yeah yeah definitely above average yeah really solid um i guess and this might be our transition into spoilers here but um i really like how they handle uh are, are we going spoilers just want to get that yeah okay. i mean are <laughs> you gonna are you are you gonna say it might be or it is <laughs> It is spoilers. Okay. All right. Make the um, call. Yeah. I go. really liked how uh Shauna handles uh the idea of prophecy and uh um managing it. And it kind of made me think of the Lycanius like, trilogy, how like you get prophecies or maybe Lycanius like, wasn't the right one, but like different like tropes of fantasy, like you get a prophecy and you try to change it, you know, like what can you do to um oh. uh, affect change? And I I felt like the description here was interesting where it's like really hard to make any change. Like she, she prevented her father's death by the spear, but then he still came home and died. So she didn't prevent the death, just really the, a little bit, the time and the means, but then how, and I'm not going to remember how to say this person's names and uh, I don't have the pronunciation guide on me, but uh, I'm going to guess Grena the the other prophetess the only other okay. prophetess um, it's probably better than i would have done i don't yeah. know um i liked how she was like she was saying like every prophet or prophetess needs to be like focused on making sure um like this one prophecy changes and like with enough nudges then we'll be able to affect change you know um rather than like okay let's let's like change this or change that and like prevent this instead it's like all you can do is really nudge. And so you have to give a lot of concentrated effort into like everyone nudging and nudging. Anyways, I thought, I felt like that was a good, um, kind of like raise the stakes a little bit in a fun way to, to play with the prophecy angle. Yeah. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of ways that prophecy gets handled in different series. One really popular one is like, you can't ever really change it, but you try anyway and yeah. you you think you do but then it is just fulfilled in like a different way that you weren't yeah. expecting i kind of think that's fun because it's it's yeah. somewhat unexpected and it's frustrating and it seems inevitable and it is and it seems somewhat realistic uh but you know i like this way i like this way too and i'm a little curious like you said because we get some hints but really this prophecy is new to this series it wasn't mentioned in yeah. the other books and I was surprised at the emphasis that it placed on Fodla as like this savior, I guess like her daughter's kind of, not really sure exactly what the prophecy yeah. means entirely at this point. Yeah, um, we kind of did a quick recap of book one and I don't know, I don't think we want to get into book one spoilers at this point, or maybe we do, I don't know. What's the spoiler level? Well, Full series. Or I so, mean, it can only go through book one since I'm on here. So I don't know. If yeah. Yeah, right, right. <clears throat> mm. yeah. Tough, tough call there. 
Let's say at the beginning of book one, book one starts and the the pro the future that Ronat has seen in Dreams of Fire has taken place, right? Like she decided she wasn't going to change that, specifically talking about Fola's daughter who is giftless, who died, her daughter mm -hmm. with Tomas, right? So that's one daughter. Um, we'll see about the other daughter. Yeah, I'm thinking that this may, may have some connection to Shauna's second, like trilogy or era that she's planning on doing. Oh, really? Okay, you think it's that far out? I kind of had a theory that, um, and I might be misremembering from this novella, even though I like, literally finished it an hour ago. Um, but it, it seems like there's a lot of assumptions from what she's seen in her uh, in her vision, and maybe. Mm maybe faulty interpretations from the Merrigan's uh, prophecy, but maybe it's not necessarily uh, children of Fola, both of them. Maybe because she just sees her holding some, like a child in her arms, like could it be someone mm -hmm. else's child? I don't know. That was kind of okay. an angle I was getting to. Cause that's yeah. the other fun thing about prophecy is like the it misinterpretations. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I also um, have no idea what the whole like don't trust the water thing. I know. Is about. I know. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. And that, again, I couldn't tell if I, if that's supposed to be mysterious or if I just wasn't remembering well from book one or what. But they, they connect Bennett Isle with water a lot. Maybe it's just kind of like don't yeah. be too trustful of what the descendants are setting up here. But she kind of says her mind is in the water or something like that, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. There's that. And then also the whole thing with Fogla, like, being attempted to be kidnapped. That yeah. Also, I'm not really sure what that is. I don't think that's been touched in the first two books. I actually asked Shauna about it, and she yeah. said it was going to be covered more in the next novella. So she's planning on writing, I believe, three novellas that are kind of interspersed throughout the uh, first three Gale Song books. She's got a whole release schedule. Yeah, where I did you ask her there? That? Oh, I uh, see. Just on I our, see. Yeah, on our Fantology yeah. Discord chat. I'm thinking it has something to do with Tomas or his father because we're pretty yeah. sure at, we're pretty sure at least Tomas is aware of this prophecy. Maybe his father. Although kind or of definitely his like, father. I thought it was definitely his father and maybe Tomas. Oh, I thought it hinted the other way. Maybe that. Because her father, his father saw the tapestry that portrayed who we're assuming Fola is, like that figure from Prophecy. Uh -huh. And we're assuming that he has shared that information with Tomas, I thought. I guess either way, it, it would yeah. make sense if, you know, they are schemers. And I'm not really sure why they would try to abduct her rather yeah. than just kind of like play a long game. But maybe maybe there's something going on there. It does seem like uh, part of the long game has been played out based on what I've read in book one without getting like detailed. Um, but I, I'm kind of feeling like the whole Tomas being so like... Um, shady i guess is the right word in this book i'm kind of i'm thinking maybe that's misdirection for who it really is because i don't see why like i don't know like it seems like he's had mm -hmm. other opportunities i don't know like he killed the or whoever is after her is most likely the one who killed the mortal boy right and like why kill and torture some mortal boy yeah if you already seems, know where she is you know seems like, weird right yeah yeah what is the connection so, there yeah like would it be a fomorian but why would the fomorians know about that and frankly the fomorians yeah. don't seem that smart <laughs> they they don't i think that was probably one of my yeah critiques of this is like they're they give off and they i guess the the ones we see in children of gods and fighting men don't but in this novella they give off a little bit of just like uh like not very thoughtful evil people just like right yeah yeah um in in children of gods and fighting men i think so the viewpoint there is is glorva i did i can never pronounce her name 
Gormla, Glom, I think. Glomla, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, so yeah. she's the viewpoint. She her she's the daughter of Ethelin. And she mm -hmm. the, the book starts out with Ethelin passing on and Glormla kind of Glormla kind of being left to her own devices and it discusses some of what's touched on here in the novella. And I, yeah, she seems more scheming, more capable than we get a sense for in this book. And and when I said that there was something in the plot that didn't really work for me, it it was this. I, I just didn't really understand. I think you're kind of saying the same thing. I didn't really understand their whole attack plan. Like, it just seemed like, real, real hasty, real rash. And I... And yeah, and this might be kind of similar to our other uh never, I don't want to get into that because it's a different series, I want to spoil it. But um it felt like B uh Baylor the evil eye, like he felt when he was first introduced in this novella and the way he's been talked about, like he was this like huge bad guy, like maybe it might be the eye and the fire, but I was thinking he's like a Sauron level threat. And uh, -huh. uh he just seemed to dispatch too too quickly and like he didn't have a great game plan. I totally understand why he was like, Hey, we know where they are. We're going to like sneak attack them and destroy them. Like I get the attack idea, but I don't, are you getting, are you well. getting characters confused? Cause Baylor of the evil eye was whatever, like millennia ago, centuries ago. And I that was like, was... no, no, that he was the leader of the Fumarians like back in the day when they were fighting not the descendants, uh, but the actual two yeah, odd and dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cannot pronounce I, that either. I thought so this was this was like the legends. And he was uh, and and that okay. was like recapped a little bit. He he was kind of dispatched, but I mean, but that story, we just kind of got like a an overview of whatever happened. I thought I this that, was supposed to be the same guy. No, no, no. This was this guy's name was uh Balarak. Yeah, I thought he, it was just like the, a like a, I thought it was like Baylor the evil eye. Like that is just like, you know how like names change over time through myths mm. and legends come and go and pass. And yeah, I know of this. Yeah. Anyways, I thought it was something like that. Yeah. Maybe that's a misread on my part then. Yeah. Incorrect. But, In incorrect. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. No, this is, this is a regular of Marion, although he does seem like extra powerful and he's able to, control the fire a bit more and call the big fireball to kill himself rather than be tortured. But regardless, well, they say, they say just like, they say yeah. just like Baylor was able to, they, they, there's a part in the book where it says that, uh, Fomorians generally can't die by fire, but, uh, Baylor, the evil eye destroyed, accidentally destroyed his army of Fomorians in fire because of, uh, the way, Lou tricked him and then they say when Bal Balorak like burns himself that it said it was just the same way so I maybe that was just saying it was a similar mm. thing I thought that was saying just the same way he destroyed his army he's destroying himself but that is true uh still maybe incorrect. It was more of a maybe it's just more of a connection I yeah. I just can't see it being I can't Shana, see it being correct because it's it's talking about us. like <laughs> this is happening way back this is like right but don't they live basically forever i guess not all of them well the original to uh Didanen, like they went they decided to like leave right yeah and but this the, is fomorian right yeah uh i don't know i don't think the fomorians live forever i thought it was something similar where they they like used to live like they live a long time and used to live even longer because they're they're not more they're immortal you know they're not I don't know to a degree, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they, they will die after long enough after long enough. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the very beginning of the first book, like Ethelin is dying just from like being old. Yeah. But is she a pure blood? I don't know if she is. <laughs> Cause they have like, they marry, they marry mortals that have children with them uh -huh. and try to find it. It's kind of like the descendants. I thought it was kind of equivalent where then they, yeah. their gifts might fade with time. But Anyways, I'm not sure on all of that, but I really do feel confident that okay. this is not the same person. I feel yeah. like maybe there was a parallel story going on. Yeah, that's that was okay. supposed to be highlighted, but uh, yeah, like I'm like 100% sure it's not the same.
Yeah. Okay. That said, I still, still think the plan that. was really <laughs> yeah, I still feel like the plan was real rash. Yeah. Like my my best analogy, it's like it's like playing a board game and you're you're making some attack against the other player and you're just like not ready to do it. And yeah. by it's like, you know, in risk, you're just gonna do a full send when clearly the other person is in a better position and you're just you're dead. Right. And yeah, so it's just seemed like they'd be better off playing the long game at that point. Because even if they were able to surprise all the descendants at their castle, I think they would have killed a lot more descendants, but it still doesn't seem like they would have won, you know? Right. And right. they only had 10, right? Warriors. It was like 10 or 11. Yeah. Like how could they really think that they're going to win? Mm. Seems, yeah, seems weird. But. Yeah. Um, Balorak's just an idiot, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But I do, I like the, uh, again, I really like the prophecy thing. It was cool to see uh, her realize she's a prophetess instead of just a witch. I was, I was kind of suspecting that because they talked about, I think Lou is the guy's name, the original like warrior um, for the, of the descendants, um, how he had the power of everyone. He's the one that killed Baylor. Right sure i'm obviously yeah. misremembering all those events yeah. but yes <laughs> yes okay yeah continue um but he had all the gifts and so i was like oh i wonder if rona is gonna have like all the gifts you know she realized she's gonna be like the misborn mm. of the uh okay <laughs> um which i'm kind of glad it it didn't like it's it's more interesting to see that she's a prophetess and like um potentially is hiding it for the rest of her life but yeah yeah I think it makes a lot of things in the first two books make more sense. Probably mostly the first book, although I'm sure there are things from book two as well. And I don't know why, like it makes total sense. One of those things is like, yeah, of course, like that, that makes sense. But I don't know, maybe when you're reading the books, you just, it's still new enough and you're discovering yeah. how everything works. You like, don't really suspect think... that there's, there's more going on. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that I think that reveal was pretty well done. I was probably starting to suspect that once they started to focus more on Ronette hearing things and the focus yeah. on the prophetess lady, like it, it it wasn't like it came out of nowhere. It was built up pretty well, mm-hmm. probably about like a third to forty percent of the way through. I was like, yeah, she's probably a, a prophetess. So I'm I'm glad that yeah. worked out. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the uh, the voice she's hearing the wind? What do you think? How do you think that plays into it? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm thinking that could be. Has that played out? From... No. Oh, go ahead. Okay. No, there, there's definitely connections. From what I remember, there are connections in the first two books, and it's slightly different. But I'm thinking it has something to do with like the not the descendants, but the the two of Dudanan. Like directly themselves. Them. Yeah. Well, yeah. They came. Because like they maybe came as is a Morgan or Merrigan. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Because it sounded like that was the same voice when she was like, I want to see like when you took my father. And like mm-hmm. that seemed like it was coming from the same voice. And so do you think do you think it is like she should or shouldn't give in to the, the voice of the wind? I'm thinking she's got to. I think like she like for better yeah. or for worse, like the I however like, it affects her, yeah. she has to. I feel like she needs to trust it. Yeah. And a lot of that's probably because the voice provided this real deep, strong, emotional moment for her mm-hmm. and the readers. So I, I feel like the voice is a positive force. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, not just, I don't, um, I guess the way it is presented by the authorities in the story, it's not just that the voice, not necessarily the voice is like incorrect and in what it's telling you to do, but just, the more you listen to it, like you are going to fracture mentally faster. And so it's more like, like just like, you know what you're supposed to do. You don't need to rely on that. And if you do, it's going to um, mm-hmm. exacerbate the issue. But I, I'm i of the opinion that I think the guidance of the vo- voice of the wind right now is too crucial to pass up regardless of mm-hmm. the side effects. But Right. And 
grainy best guess there yeah Yeah. she she mentions that it, it takes you know you're good for about what is she, she said like about 100 years <laughs> yeah. and probably about as long as you're gonna be able to maintain your sanity and you know lo and behold 100 years have passed yeah give or give or take as we get into the yeah, first book. the first yeah the first two novels so kind of hitting yeah that you know real important point yeah I, I didn't even make that connection that's a really good call out which um if this is your entry into children of uh or the gale song saga trilogy um I feel like the saga I'm, saga I'm not sure. okay yeah um then like that's that's some good tension for continuing into book one um yeah 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 uh you mentioned there is uh like a, a scene that was really like was done really well emotionally was that the uh the retrieving her father scene it was the seeing the ancestors scene where they where come she and like yeah where she saw yeah like her her father and mother and and her grandparents and like yeah just yeah and she realized you know my father's been around for 300 years but i've only known him for like 30 years and yeah the, yeah just the whole the the familial connections but also the unknown in that but like mm -hmm. the obvious bonds and, and love that there is through all that i think that that was really well done and, and you know kind of got me yeah yeah same i i really liked the the description of like her mother waking her father up and now he's immediately just like so excited you know because i can't remember how long ago her mother passed but it was probably like 18 years ish because Fola was really young and she's 20 ish in this book yeah. um so like i don't know like for most of uh i don't know that's like a decent amount of time regardless of how long you live so it was cool to see just how excited he was and moving on to the other world um uh that makes me think of the uh and they talk about this in her other books as well, but just the like conflict and contention there is about if you have a giftless child um, or like if you fall in love with a mortal and how, how that plays out with everything um, just because like you live so much longer than them. And so like, I don't know, it's just, an, I think that is like one of the highest points of her series is that, uh realistic interplay of like having these abilities and like how that would play with like relationships and everything right right these people can live super long may have magical powers what are the implications of that yeah more than and more so also, than just yeah. powerful it's like yeah i watched my child grow up and die you know and right yeah um and, it, and it, like how they mentioned the two there's like two warriors who have uh, descendants from warring mortal clans and how they're both supporting their, their clan because of that. And like, yeah, I don't know. That's like a, a fascinating turn to it. Yeah. This book really didn't have much by way of the uh, mortal entry into the conflict. Oh the, yeah. Uh, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. The other two books are much more heavy on that angle too, which I think, is some nice conflict where you know you have a society where or like history is advancing magic is kind of leaving the world slowly and then how does that like play out there's some really interesting themes that it gets mm -hmm. into yeah and you mentioned the giftless children and and the uh it was really rough that the uh the children were not accepted into yeah. the other world that's like yeah old school purgatory stuff going on there but i mean i guess this is yeah. like 1000 ad so it kind of like fits the time frame of Tracks. those ideas right <laughs> yeah and i can't remember was that where they were just like oh like mortals don't have a connection to the other world so we like they're like we physically can't bring them there i can't remember it like it feels kind of like a i don't know kind of like a cop out I feel yeah. like the mortal, the giftless children are, are like, are a little too discarded, <laughs> in my opinion. But, well, I think some of our characters feel that way as well. While yeah. other characters are fine to just discard them, and that's going to be a conflict yeah. going forward as well. Yeah, for sure.
yeah, the series has a really good layer of, uh, you know, real deep character focus on a few, bringing in a lot of realistic societal conflicts, but making it a story that really flows well and tracks and doesn't really take, you know, it's not like a Malazan big brain thing that you have to really stretch to follow it's it's very seamless all the way through and, and it weaves really well yeah yeah it's really it's really personal it feels like it's written at a very personal level um yeah and uh not much not much in the way of uh, romance in this story but if you liked this no novella and you're looking for more romance there is some that enters mm -hmm. into the other books which I think is pretty well done. I like romance and fantasy and I don't think there's a lot of good romance. And, um, and when I say good romance, I don't mean romanticy. <laughs> Although I, I haven't, <laughs> not? <laughs> I haven't really given it a super fair shake, but I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think you have, uh, yeah, but maybe I haven't either, but I share your opinion. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, we're just the grumpy old men of fantasy. Yeah. But... Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think I think this is well done and not too cheesy or like overly sexualized romance. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, any yeah. other? Yeah. Any other opinions on this? I think maybe we both kind of felt like it could have been a little longer. Like, I think one thing that really would have made it stronger is if it was a little longer and the length was spent on developing what the Fumerians were doing, why they had that plan, give it a little more balance to the story, because I think one thing that books one and two do really well is they interplay the two stories and they make both sides seem somewhat sympathetic. Whereas yeah. in this one, it's just like, but Marians are evil and stupid. <laughs> yeah. And that might be just the viewpoint because you don't get that counter viewpoint, but yeah, like I, I think there is something to be said about how the, uh, at least book one, like you really, like you feel the persecution of the Fumarians more and like the, like there's like the survival instinct, like, like at a base level, like everyone wants to survive. And anyways, um, yeah, other than that, I would just say um, join our discord. If you haven't, Shauna uh, is pretty active in there. Um, not trying to steal uh, her fans from other avenues she has. Like if she has her own discord, I don't, I don't even know Please should join that. She has a really cool website. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been really cool uh, reading her books. Yeah. We probably don't want to advertise her <laughs> as like being available to answer any questions. That's on true. Her discord, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, no, she is a, um, yeah, she, she's a, uh, been a member on there for a while. It's been fun to kind of watch the book series uh, develop and get released. And, and like, you know, even though we have that connection to her, like I'm being like really sincere when I say I really do enjoy the books. Yeah, same. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you read the novella and you haven't checked out the books yet, uh, I think like now is a great time. She has a pretty, like pretty ambitious release schedule that yeah. uh, that she's like hitting uh, her deadlines and everything. So I think this is one where you can expect books to be coming out pretty regularly, whether it's a novella she has more novellas planned or a, another novel. And she's also planning an expansion into like this next era, which I don't really know exactly what that means. But, you know, I figure maybe there's like a time skip, maybe something else happens at the end of the trilogy. Uh, but I, I think if you, you know, if you enjoyed the book, there's like a lot more to to be had here. Same. Yeah. yeah. Go, go read it. All right. Thanks, Jake. <laughs> See you guys. Peace.